Welcome to Writing the Wrong Way, where we talk about how writing works, how writers work, and why the best writers risk being strange. And today we're also talking about how who writers work with. Uh, and my guest uh, is uh, welcoming back to the show Agent Emmy, as we uh, you know call <laughs> call Emmy around the office or the studio. Uh, not my agent, but you know my uh, partner's agent. Uh, and so. Uh, we are always like saying Agent Emmy, Agent Emmy. Uh, <laughs> I feel like such a super spy when yeah. you folks call me that. It makes me really happy. Yeah, <laughs> on his podcast, he mentions that a lot too. And yeah. so anyway, um, uh, Emmy Higg Nordstrom Higdon uh, works for Westwood Creative Artists um, and uh, yeah, is an agent of a number of people. And what uh, Emmy's going to talk to us about today is how to approach an agent more than anything else like and what are some of the sort of mistakes that writers often make when approaching agents so we can talk about other things as well i think but that's sort of like the core uh because one um uh you were just saying that you wanted to talk about that <laughs> and i think it's a good topic um i've been waiting for somebody to you know want to talk about that precise thing but also i get a lot of questions from people about agents i often don't have maybe the best answers. Cause I don't have an agent. Like I've never had an agent. Uh, although I don't have anything against having an agent. I just, you know, <laughs> either haven't had the project for the agent or just haven't had the agent for the project, uh, up to this point, you know? So I, I, I mean, I, I'm sure that'll change. Uh, but, uh, my experience with agents is to some degree limited in that sense. Mm. Um, and so I, always like to just go to the source for, you know, answers to questions rather than kind of making assumptions myself. So, uh, yeah. So thanks, uh, for joining us here. And can, before we kind of get into the do's and don'ts of approaching an agent and some of the common kind of mistakes writers maybe make, uh, I wonder if we could just touch a little bit on something that, um, I keep thinking about and, you know, kind of saying to people in <laughs> different ways, uh, which is, Often people just ask me that basic question of like, why don't you have an agent right. or should you have an agent? Or should they have an agent? And mm -hmm. it's hard to answer that question. I find because the answer is very different. Like the, the reason I don't have an agent isn't necessarily ha have anything to do with agents uh, and doesn't necessarily have anything to do with whether they should have an agent or not, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, because it really is there's a kind of an answer to that question that people hate, which, <laughs> yeah. which is the counter question. Uh, well, what do you want? Absolutely. Uh, and what I like to say about agents or lawyers or publishers or any other professionals that an artist would work with is, you know, the agent can agent better than you, uh, but they don't know what you want. And so there's a, a limit to like their powers unless you can mm -hmm. clarify to them what you want. And that could be what you want in your career. It could be what you want in this for this project. Um, it, you know, it could just be what you want in deal terms. You know, it, it's really hard for there. There's assumptions that uh, sometimes people make about one another when they're working together in a professional relationship. And I find that writers are often very unclear with what they want um, either to themselves or to their agents. <laughs> and sure. so uh, I think I, I'm curious to know one, uh, how do you like get to the heart of mm -hmm. what you kind of the writer wants? Because you are an agent that of the ones I've talked to and, you know, know like friends have, mm -hmm. um, you are one that kind of has spent more time on this with the, I remember when you kind of, I kind of connected you with Gregory. Mm -hmm. He was mentioning to me, like, a little bit about your early interactions of kind of negotiating, like where are you going to work together and so on. Right. And he was saying he was very impressed that you were kind of like asking him what he wanted and like trying to get at like his goals and his mm -hmm. get some clarity on what he does. Um, and and he felt like it was a very personalized approach that you were taking compared to other agents he had talked to in the past and then decided not to go with. Mm -hmm. um, and so. I'm always just kind of curious about like, one, how do you just kind of approach that initial kind of like figuring out what this writer wants yeah, absolutely. and how does that matter to like how you work? Right. And then maybe from there we can flow into like, okay, well, how does a person kind of make clear what it is that they want uh, when they're approaching an agent and what are some yeah, good and bad sure. ways to do that? Yeah, honestly, I'm probably the first agent to tell people that like having an agent isn't for everybody. Um, 
I think that, like, I mean, I really love my job and I think that having an agent can be super valuable depending on your goals, but it's definitely not, you know, I wouldn't say that it's a hard and fast need for all authors to have an agent for sure. Um, I think, first of all, like a healthy publishing ecosystem needs to have authors who are self-publishing, authors who are publishing with indie presses, and then authors who are publishing with more traditional presses. And one of the big things I think that a lot of authors don't realize is that different agents have dis different specialties, first of all. So I work with a number of people who do publish with independent presses and also with traditional kind of like the multinational um, larger presses. But there are some agents who only work with the bigger companies or the bigger publishers. And there are some agents again who sort of have like a genre niche or like a format niche so they'll only work with graphic novelists or they'll only work with sci-fi fantasy or they'll only work in romance like that kind of um those kinds of distinctions and then also age categories is a big one so you know I think we'll primarily talk about writing for adults but um there are some agents as well who only work with children's books or who only work with adult books or fiction, nonfiction. There's all kinds of like kind of arbitrary <laughs> distinctions that agents make in their work. So yeah, the first thing that people need to know is whether or not the agent that they have is able to kind of have the network that they're looking for in terms of where they would like to sell their books, because that's the primary role that an agent plays. So the first thing obviously is to know where you'd like your books to be but once you kind of have your own goals in your mind and where you'd like to see your books and what kinds of um kind of I, I talk about comp titles, but mostly in terms of like what kinds of books you'd like your book to share the shelves with. So, for example, I haven't done a huge number of sales in like specifically like hard science fiction or like epic fantasy. Those are not strong suits of mine um, editorially as well. Like I'm a really hands on editor with my clients and like I really love reading those genres, but I wouldn't say I specialize in editing them. So I tend not to work with authors who write only in those genres because that's not my strength. Um, that said, like if an author works in multiple genres, sometimes that's okay because if we can find the right fit for one project, that's different than trying to build a career entirely in one genre or entirely in like one sort of niche. Whereas some agents prefer that I tend to work with authors who hop around a little bit more and who kind of do, I have some authors who write in multiple age categories or who are interested in both fiction and nonfiction, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think especially for authors who are really interested in self-publishing and have like a knack for marketing themselves and all of that kind of thing, um, you know, finding printers, all of those like logistical elements that are involved in self-publishing. Um, I think that like an agent is essentially useless to them. You know, if you have all those skills, you don't need a big publisher to back you and you don't need like an agent to get messy with your work. It For independent authors, I would say that it's like a little bit more of a gray area. I know some authors do so well on their own, unrepresented, um, working with even some of the larger independent presses and a lot of them do take unsolicited submissions. So if you have sort of the strength to be able to and the time and energy and all of that, to be able to pitch your book successfully and you have other people you can consult with on your contracts or you feel confident doing that yourself then it's not really a necessity it's more of a preference um, and especially for those people it's important to know that your agent is willing to do independent contracts because some agents won't they'll only do kind of the bigger corporate publishers so that's a really essential question to ask when you're getting to know an agent and then for people who want to work with the large multinational publishers unfortunately it's sort of like an institutional necessity to have an agent and i would say like that's not only because the publishers tend to sort of gatekeep by not accepting submissions directly from authors but also for the sake of the contract um you know, like a lot of independent publishers, I see their contracts are like, you know, seven to 10 pages long, the terms are pretty clear and like fairly easy to understand. But once you're negotiating with like Penguin Random House or something like that, you're looking at like a 30 page legal document. So having someone who understands not only like the legal jargon, but also sort of the industry standards and has a boilerplate in place can be like a huge benefit. So yeah, I would say whether or not you want an agent depends on where you see your book fitting in and not all books fit in in all places. So that's sort of a, <laughs> I feel like an introspective talk to have with yourself before you approach an agent to represent your work. How, how do you feel that talk? How does the talk usually go though, initially, like when you're actually kind of 
talking to, we, we, let's say somebody has submitted to yeah. you. Let's just kind of bring it right to the nuts and bolts of the kind of For topic sure. here. So let's say I'm a writer. So, so, mm. so first, like myself. Okay. Yeah. I'm a person who uh, does some self publishing projects where I, you know, yeah, I'm going out and printing things myself and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm a person who works with independent publishers mm -hmm. um, as well, you know, uh, not self publishing, but, you know, working with kind totally. of, uh, I would say, mid to large size independent publishers. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm a person who has projects coming at me. Uh, like mm -hmm. I can see down the pipe and I can see like a couple projects that are coming where sure. I'm going to go towards like a multinational large publisher. Mm -hmm. So to this point, I haven't really felt the need for an agent. Um, uh, although I would have been averse to one. Uh, right. But I've also, uh, you know, I, I want it to be a scenario where they're, it's also worth their time. Yeah, totally. <laughs> like it's not really sure. worth their time for the projects I'm doing right now, just mm -hmm. because, you know, they're slower burn things. Totally. Um, or it's, you know, feels like comics where, you know, often agents mm -hmm. don't have as much use in that arena. Um, but, uh, but I can see down the, the pipe, you know, I'm going to hit sure. on a couple of large projects. So at that point, you know, I'm going to like, uh, like uh, actually the one agent that I did get very close to possibly being representing me, it, it literally wrote to me and said, you know, this is great. I would love the representative project. He goes, but he goes, to be honest, I'd just be wasting your time. <laughs> he goes, <laughs> he's like, yeah. it sounds like you've got it all lined up and you know, all I would do is come in and take money from you at, at this point. Yeah, for sure. He's like, unless you got another project in the wings that would work and I, and I didn't. So he, you know, yeah, he was absolutely. very good uh, about that. Uh, but like most people aren't that transparent and honest mm. uh, in the publishing industry necessarily. Yeah. Um, although they <laughs> can be, they cannot be right. But um, uh, anyway, you know, so I'm looking, so let's say, you know, this project comes down the pipe and I'm going to go, you know, approach an agent. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, whether I'm, you know, a person with track record like myself or whether I'm a newer person. So first off, is there a different way to approach that based on whether I've got the track record or don't? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for me, I would say, and for most agents, I don't know that the track record matters too too much but it's always nice to know when people have experience for me personally like I mostly ask about experience so that I can have a sense of like what it would be like to work with that person so because I'm in it I do editorial work with my clients before we take the books out on submission it's good for me to know whether people have like collaborated on editorial before especially that's always my like biggest question mark because it can be such I mean, honestly, the one that's the hardest is when it's a really tough emotional process for people, you know, when they haven't had that like experience of having critique that's been challenging or they maybe they have, but like from a friend or from like someone they really trust and all of a sudden I'm this stranger marching in and like their manuscript is coming back to them like filled with track changes and they're like, whoa, like what is happening here, you know, so I like to know people's experience more because of that. But of course, like selling a book to a big publisher, they do want to know that people have, if they have a sales record that they, you know, how they got there and what it is that, what kind of community support they have and all of that kind of stuff. So, I mean, some of that stuff are things, or some of those figures, I would say, are things that we would include in like a proposal or a pitch. The rest of it is just to know kind of like where we're at in terms of a starting point, because I've worked with authors who are like brand new, have never gotten feedback before. But of course, I'm going to approach that process a little bit differently than with someone like you who's used to like working with multiple people and having lots of hands in the pot. So yeah, it's more more so to determine like, all right, where would our starting point be? Like, what would this be like for both of us? So to, so to bring it close to the topic here, what are the mistakes you see people making in this particular arena with either explaining or refusing to explain perhaps their track record? Yeah, for sure. I mean, so people, I get asked all the time about query letters, right? Like people, there's such a like fervent discourse around query letters these days. I don't know what it is, but it's almost like people think that if they put a comma in the wrong place in their query letter, like that's going to be the be all end all. And that's just not the case. I mean, I, in terms of experience, I like to see a bio in a query letter because that's going to be helpful to know kind of where people are coming from and also like just who I'm talking to. I mean, that's most of the point of a query letter because I'm going to read your writing either way right so it's nice to know like why do you want this like where are you going with this 
project? Like what made you come out and think like, okay, this is the one that I'm going to try and get an agent for. Um, and so like, that's kind of what I like to see in a query letter in terms of the experience and things like that. And for a lot of people, honestly, it's more of a conversation than people think. Like if I read the writing and I think it's great, I'm, my first email back isn't just going to be like, okay, send me more of your writing. Like, I also need to know more about you as a person and like what it is. Could we be good collaborators? Like, would we work well together? Do I have kind of the editorial network you're looking for? Because otherwise, like reading your whole book, it might be fun for me, but it's a waste of your time. So I think that that's where the experience part really comes in, in terms of the approach is that conversation of like, okay, like if you've done all these things before, like, what is it that you want to do differently now that I could help you with? or not now let me just flag something you said so you, you mentioned you know people over invest in the query letters i so one i think that's uh, an excellent point you know I, I often like yeah you the online discussion about query letters makes it seem like so it they'll make or break <laughs> this scenario like oh someone's yeah. gonna buy it because the query letter is so great it's like i always say to people like the only reason that you have that query letter is to convince mm -hmm. somebody to look at the manuscript a hundred percent. Yeah. And, you know, you just, you're just getting them. You just want them to bounce off that letter as fast as possible. So like it yeah. should be short. It should be short. I always like quote Pink Floyd, short, sharp shock, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, exactly. just make it a short, sharp shock. And then, you know, they're out into the manuscript ideally. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but, and you had mentioned yourself, you know, you're going to read your writing either way. I wonder if that's always true though. Is there things that people can do in that query to destroy themselves where you're not going to look at that manuscript? I would say the only thing that they could really do is either be super, super mean. <laughs> Sometimes you'd be surprised the things that people write in query letters. If there's something in there that's like a real red flag about how they're addressing me or other agents or other authors, like, yeah, that'll be a bit of a turnoff for me because I like ultimately we're collaborating right on a book. So like, I don't really want to work with you if you're going to be super, super, competitive and rude towards other people throughout the whole process and also more than that like am I going to want to hand you off to one of my editorial contacts knowing you're kind of a jerk so <laughs> if there's something in there that I'm like oh that's like a really rude thing to say like probably that's going to be a red flag but honestly other than that like the only thing that would really come up in a query letter that I think would be like a hard no would be if it just wasn't what I was looking for you know what I mean like I'm always surprised how many people send me manuscripts that are over a hundred thousand words because I say every chance I'm given that I don't look at them. <laughs> so if people, you know, like if people read my manuscript wish list and it says like, do not send me manuscripts over a hundred thousand words, I will not read them. Like no matter how you frame it, I'm not going to read it. <laughs> like, so that'll be one of, you know, there are a few like hard no's where like, it's very clear that people think they're the exception to whatever it is that I've put out into the world or that, it just isn't, you know, like maybe they, it, it's not the exception. It just isn't what I'm looking for at the time or what I'm like representing. And I haven't articulated that well, or they've interpreted it differently, something like that. But other than that, I wouldn't say that there's anything in a query letter that would make me like not read the writing at all. Now, once you're reading the writing, <clears throat> is there, uh, what are some of the big things that you see that makes you stop reading? I always think that's yeah. the litmus test. I always think I always often talk about Stephen King has this had this. I don't know if he still does it. He used to do this thing where what Stephen King would do is he would print out his manuscript when it was done. He'd put it on his kitchen table for his wife to read, and then you know she just read it when she got around to reading it. And yeah. what I always love, but what what she would do is if she, let's say she picked it up and started reading it, and then she put it down and went and did the dishes, he would grab the book, find the page where he stopped. She stopped reading and then rewrite it. Um, yeah, because of so course smart. his goal was just to move everyone forward to the next page, mm -hmm. to the next page, to the next page. And that became of course the hallmark of King's style. Yeah, uh, so I always think about like whether there's a rational reason or not, like why are they putting it down? Why do you stop reading? So yeah. you may or may not have rational reasons. For, I'm assuming you have rationalizations as to why you're stopping <laughs> reading, uh, but yeah. like, what are some of them? What are the things that kind of get you to stop? And you're like, Either you're just out of it, whether you're just done with this manuscript or even temporarily you stop before coming back. So I actually have a document because I spend a lot of time in our submissions inbox, like in general for Westwood. So I help distribute. We all sort of take turns like distributing the queries out to everyone because we just have like a central inbox that everything comes into. Um, 
And so not only do I manage my own queries, but I also like distribute everyone else's. And then I also sometimes help to make the decisions about like if queries come in and they're not addressed to anyone, like people just sometimes query the agency, then who should they go to? Like, should we look at it? What it like, what happens with this like sort of limbo document? So I have a whole bunch of, because we don't use like a query manager system, I have a whole bunch of like form emails that I have like pre-written that I always personalize them or I try to, but what like easy copy and paste. So one of the biggest things that we get all the time is that people query agents that are closed. That happens constantly. So make sure that you check that the person you're querying actually is like willing and ready to receive the query because like it's shocking how often people put it's just heartbreaking to honestly to me because I know how much work people put into these packages when you know they spend an hour like writing this email and like weeks crafting a query letter and then they send it off and I'm just going to respond with like sorry but like this agent isn't open to queries right now or people will see that like an agent is only open to queries by referral and they'll somehow try to like spin their query as though you know, we should look at it anyway, when like the agent is not going to look at it. Like, I'm sorry, but if they say no, like really means they're too busy. Like they just don't have the time. So that's a big one. Can but, you explain quickly what yeah. that means? Like why an agent would be closed to submissions? Because I find people don't mm -hmm. understand that idea. Yeah, usually it's because we're too busy, honestly, like for whatever reason, like it might be personal, it might be business, like they maybe they have like a book launch coming up that's just like consuming all of their time and they don't have time to read queries. Um, those are the reasons why I close temporarily because I'm a fairly new agent. So in general, I'm open, but there are times where like for three or four months, like for example, earlier this year, I got bitten by a dog and I had to, I couldn't type. Like that was not a good time for me to be looking at queries because I couldn't respond to anyone. So like silly things like that happen. But then also, you know, sometimes if I have a client, for example, who's working on a book and for whatever reason, say the editorial process is like very intense and we're going back and forth on, you know, like small details or like we, I did a cookbook earlier this like that came out earlier this year and there was so much back and forth during the production of that book about you know photos and color temperatures and the cover and because it was a four color book there's so much more that goes into the production aspect than for like a normal prose book where we like might have a couple of exchanges over the cover but those sorts of things that just like take up a lot of time but there are some agents that are just like fully closed or who are closed like more long term. And that's usually because their list is full. Like if they can only, you know, like some of the agents who I work with have been in the business for like 30 years. They have like 100 clients on their list. They have an assistant. They have them. And then like just the volume of work is too much, you know, to be able to sort of take on new people or read new things because their current clients are constantly sending them new work. They're negotiating deals on their behalf, that kind of thing. And so sometimes they might consider someone new if it's someone who's brought to them by a current client or by like a colleague that they really trust. But generally speaking, they're not going to be looking at adding new authors to their roster. Um, and most of the time, it wouldn't be fair if they did, because they wouldn't really have time to support them well enough to help them to develop their careers. So that's I, those are like the most common reasons I can think of why people would close. So what are some of the other big uh, no's that you end up giving out to people and why? Yeah, so one that comes up all the time, and especially among authors who do have fingers in multiple pots, like self-publishing and indie publishing, is when a book has already been published. So I know that we, like Gregory, uh, who is a client of mine, we talk all the time about this because it's like, it's such contentious space. Yeah, we always discuss this idea yeah. and, and how ridiculous we think it is, but it but it yeah. is, you are correct though. It is yeah. a thing that will kill a deal in traditional publishing often, 100%. whether yeah. it should or not. Exactly. And it, the rationale for it is kind of backwards of what people think, because what happens all the time is that we'll have authors who come to us who have written, let's say a novel for the sake of argument, because it's a little bit different with graphic books or comics or illustrated works. But for argument's sake, let's say a novel, they've written it, they put it out on, you know, like, Amazon self-publishing or something like that, or even like Wattpad. Um, but like any online platform where people are like, sometimes it's like pay to play and sometimes it's free, but like where people are reading their book and being counted for reading it. And they'll be like, I got, you know, like X number of readers for this book. 
it definitely needs a better home. You know, there's obviously a proven audience for this, or even sometimes it'll be people who've like taken things. I know that like, there are a lot of people who take things that they've self-published to conventions and things like that. And they'll be like, this sells so well at conventions and blah, blah, blah. People think that what I can do then as an agent is like, take those impressive numbers and like take them to a publisher and be like, look, this is amazing. Obviously there's an audience for this book. It's going to sell really well. But actually what publishers see is like, okay, that audience has already been saturated or there's a piece of that pie that's been taken already. I'm never going to be able to sell this to my marketing team. And so you might like, there are, I will say that there are exceptions to this. Obviously one of the big ones has been TikTok, honestly, like that's been like TikTok has been such a weird addition to the publishing landscape. I don't know where it's going. I don't really understand how it's working, but there have been a few books, several books that have been self-published that have gone viral on TikTok and publishers have jumped on them and republished them right away. But that's not something you can engineer for yourself, just to be clear. Like you cannot pop your self-published book on TikTok and be like, okay, all of a sudden, you know billions of people want this book and I'm going to bring it to Tor and they're going to be like great Tor like handpicks those books <laughs> it's very rare that like you can make that happen for yourself the other thing that like does sometimes happen is that you know especially in genres like romance or um, science fiction fantasy like jo more genre quote-unquote categories there are publishers who are open to seeing books especially that have been revised or that were published a long time ago that had like kind of a cult following and they'd like to bring them back to a wider audience. So those sorts of things do happen. But for most traditional publishers, if a book has been made available at all, I'm going to get like an automatic pass when I send that out. So as an agent, it's a really, really difficult thing to make a case for. Um, sometimes what we can do is like take a book that's been self-published or something like that out for international rights or translation rights if you have another project that we're going to take out for like a regular submission so there are some cases but if you're querying a book that's already been published it's almost certain that an agent is going to be like i can't do anything with this for you i'm really sorry and just like form email send you away <laughs> my my point of view of it on Personally, it's just, I think publishers are wrong and it's a oh. bad approach, but I also think that there's no reason you should be self-publishing a book if you want to take a traditional publisher. It's like 100%. you should have done one or the other. And I don't understand why you would switch your plan midstream. Like what I yes. don't like about the idea is that you're changing your plan partway through. Totally. Which suggests that you didn't have a good plan in the first place. Now I know yeah. for some people that's there's good legitimate reasons why you might do it. And as you yeah, say, the graphic totally. novel space or the comic book space is very different. Totally different. Yeah. But um, it is one of these things where I think, while I don't think publishers are right on this count, I do kind of understand the logic yeah. of, well, it seems like that person doesn't know what they're doing on a certain level. Yeah. And they're approaching us now, asking us a question that we're going to tell them no to. Like, So I feel like there's like a bit of a self-fulfilling aspect where it kind of just... I, I think, again, ultimately, I, I don't like that attitude that publishing has about it, but totally. I, I understand where it comes from and why it's kind of there a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's honestly, to me, it reflects like a lack of understanding in publishing about the internet landscape. Like, yes. the, I think publishing traditionally just like doesn't have a great grasp as to like what publishing online means as a litmus test for interest or even publishing physically into like a small community but regardless like <laughs> I haven't seen it change yet at least for prose I will say that for graphic novels it's becoming quite different I think that publishers who publish especially comic comics and graphic novels like they have I think a bit more of a forward-thinking business model in general and they tend to like wrap their heads around the digital landscape a little bit better because they've seen how well web comics can translate into published works but i don't think that prose publishers have caught up to that at all <laughs> so what are the other big uh problems mm -hmm. that you end up hitting in a manuscript yeah so something that happens all the time for me like i said is the word limit um i won't dig into that except to say that it really is just a cost question with publishers they can't publish enormous hardcover books um like they used to and have them be affordable so that's 
I mean, I, as much as I explain it, I know that people want to write 500,000 word books. So like, I understand the draw, but as a debut author, I would always just encourage people to try and keep it like compact and also standalone. It gives you your best chance at being published, even if that sucks, which I understand that it does in many cases. That's sort of where we are with, um, with like the publishing climate the way that it is um for me we, personal oh sorry yes let me just unpack that real slightly yeah. like i think what people often don't understand about that is because mm -hmm. they people look at the shelves and they see series 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 they see big <laughs> thick series books and they think well that makes no sense publishers obviously publishing this mm -hmm. but i think what, what you make a good point though that like uh, when we're talking to a debut author two things yeah. that those authors don't really think a lot about although is from the publisher's point of view <clears throat> There's you, they got to print these books and printing the books involves paper <laughs> yeah, and it involves shipping the paper. Mm -hmm. And the th if you've got a book that's that thick or a book that's that thick, you can yeah. put like twice as many of th these in a box. Yes, totally. And, and it's the same weight as like half as many of these. And that makes a massive difference. People don't think about just the logistics of what publishers are under. Never mind, yeah. as you say, like whether they're in for multi books or not. Um, so, I, I mean, there's a, so many logistical things that I don't know that writers need to understand necessarily, but mm -hmm. they don't understand it. And uh, <laughs> because they don't understand it, um, I think sometimes they are confused, like why publishers do certain things or what their attitudes are. Um, but you got to understand just if you're out there thinking about like your book, just literally think about, I, I would really encourage writers, mm -hmm. even who, who don't intend to self-publish, I would encourage them to just go a little bit down that path. Like call up a printer and quote, imagine your book is, you know, like quote it out. Imagine you're going to publish it and go get a quote and see how much it costs to print that a thousand copies of that book. Oh, yeah. and you'll, then you'll start to get a sense of like how much, imagine you were spending that money rather than the publisher and imagine you had to make a case to yourself for spending the money. Could you do it? hundred percent. I mean, honestly, like I've had this conversation with editors, especially when I first started out, because I didn't understand either. I was, you know, I would sometimes go to people and I would ask them their preferences for what it was that they were looking for. And, you know, at least as a new agent, you get like the luxury of being like, why is that? Like, <laughs> or I mean, people you have a good relationship with too. Sometimes I am like, why are, why like, why are you looking for that? Like, that's weird, <laughs> you know? And one of the things that I heard all the time was that they were looking for shorter books. And it feels very counterintuitive, you know, because as a reader, you would think like, exactly, you walk into a store, you see like 15 of a series of some things and readers can't get enough of them, you know? So why are publishers looking for books that are short and standalone when readers clearly have like a voracious appetite, right? But that is it often comes down to paper costs like it's especially since 2020 I could talk about this all day but there was a law that passed in China that was basically an environmental regulation that shut down a whole bunch of paper mills and yep. people don't necessarily compute either that like when we talk about paper like we're talking about everything from like the box that your Amazon package comes in to like the special edition book that you're ordering from subterranean press for you know $150 or whatever or more <laughs> but like all of that paper comes from the same place right and so as ordering and shipping and those kinds of demands go up and as the population grows we have like really basic paper needs like paper towel and boxes and those sorts of things books are a luxury product and so especially in North America where books have always been seen as like a luxury object we've used all kinds of different kinds of paper to make books over the years. And that range is first of all, getting much smaller, like as in terms of what's available. And also it's becoming like just much harder and more expensive to get the base materials. So right now there is a, like with the machinery that we use to make books to make a hardback book, basically like the top length that a publisher wants to do is 400 pages because once you go past that it's like a different mechanical process that's required to make the book and it costs much more so let's say the cutoff is like around 400 pages how much does it cost to buy a 400 page hardback book like and especially in Canada I think we're acutely aware of this because you get like the books that have the U.S. you know price on them and the Canadian price on them. If it's a $35 book or $40 book in the US, anywhere else in the world, it's going to be like $45, $50 to buy 
already you're setting yourself up for failure as a debut author. How many people are going to be able to afford to buy that book, let alone read it and bump the sales up and review it, get it on TV, get it in the newspaper, like all of those things in terms of the time investment required. So yeah, like it's really, really basic logistic questions sometimes that mean that like when you send me an email and you're like, no, really, my book really is worth 101,000 words. Like I'm still going to pass because it means that you're just not listening to what the industry that you're trying to break into is saying to you and that's a huge problem <laughs> and they're throwing and people don't understand like the model is they're throwing spaghetti at a wall and they're seeing mm -hmm. what spaghetti sticks and it, they don't want to yes. throw a hundred thousand dollar spaghetti at the wall no <laughs> they'd rather spo throw twenty thousand dollars spaghetti exactly. then if that hey if that sticks sure we'll throw a hundred thousand dollars at it next mm -hmm. time you know, uh, and then maybe we're into like a five volume deal or, or whatever, you know, Yeah, 100%. They still happen. It just doesn't usually happen for debut authors. That's My friend just got one. Uh, but yeah. at the same time, it's not her first book. Yeah, we did an, a deal in 2022 at Westwood for six books for one of our like super established authors. Like that doesn't come across along very often. But like, if you are if you are an author who's trustworthy and churning out books and the publisher knows you can write quickly and you're reliable and all of those things like yeah 100 percent. but they don't know that when it's your very first novel they just know that it's possible you spent your entire life writing this one book and you might not have another book in you you might not have goals to write other books or whatever or even if you do life might happen and things might change for you so you need to really establish yourself as a professional in the industry before they're going to invest that kind of money in your work my daughter's reading for her, uh, an indie publisher here, like doing just kind of reading the slush pile for him. I love that. And she was kind of having a hard time. She's like, well, what do I do with this? She's like, I, I'm reading some of these things. She goes, it's like, I don't know how I feel. Like, like yeah, it's good, but I don't know how good is it. I, I said to her, well, think about it this way. I go, "Would you, you're gonna, are you going to turn around and tell that guy to spend $40,000 on it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, would you spend $40,000 mm -hmm. on it? Like, so some stuff is really good. But is it that good? Exactly. And that's why when agents say like, it's not the right fit or like it just didn't have that like sparkle for me or something like that. Like sometimes it's true. The query can be great and your writing can be great. But like if I just don't feel passionately about it, like am I going to spend the next year of my life working on this book that like might not go anywhere? Like you really have to feel strongly that like what you're working on has potential. You know what I mean? I always think about when I used to be in music, there was a guy I met, uh, some guys I kind of knew, um, they got signed by Chad Kroger's label mm -hmm. in conjunction with another label, a larger label, right. Kroger's label is on kind of thing. And so um, the big producer for that, for Roadrunner Records was in town. And I was talking to him and I was saying, hey, I'll go. he was the guy who signed Nickelback. That was his one of his right. recent claims to fame. And I asked him, I said, you know, no offense to Nickelback, I go, but they're not the best band. Mm -hmm. I go, so let, explain to me, like, why did you sign Nickelback? And he said to me, he goes, look, he goes, uh, he's like, you're right. He goes, they're, I mean, he's like, obviously, I think they're a good band. He goes, and I wasn't going to sign them because uh, they kept sending me their mm -hmm. tapes and all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, it's good. He goes, but, you know. Yeah, it wasn't really my thing exact as much as other stuff. You know, is it million dollars good? Mm -hmm. uh, but Kroger kind of hit on, got on him like, come see a show, come see a show, come see a show. So finally, right. he's like, you know, I got a layover in Vancouver when they happen to have a show. Right. Because if you pick me up at the airport and drive me to the show, I'll watch the show as long as you drive me back to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> right. So he, so he does this, and he said when he's on the, he, he, so he's when, so Kroger picks him up. As they're driving to the venue, a Nickelback song comes on the radio. Mm -hmm. They get to the venue. The doors are closed. There's a line around the block right? Uh, to waiting to get in. Because then he watches a show. You know, he cabs it back to the airport. Another Nickelback song comes on the radio. Mm -hmm. He said, he goes, yeah. He goes, so I got home and I signed Nickelback. He's yeah. like, but that's kind of, he goes, at this, he goes earlier today, because he was just walking around Winnipeg. He goes, mm -hmm. earlier today, he goes, I was on the street and I heard a guy playing guitar. He goes, that guy is better than Chad Kroger. Right. He goes, I gave him $20. He was so good. He goes, I could have given him a million dollars though. Yeah. He's like, but you know, I don't know if the other stuff is in place. Like, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In the publishing sort of challenge that we're facing right now as well, that's, I hate the word unprecedented. I have really come to loathe that word, but that 
at least in recorded history in North America, is unprecedented, is that 75% of book sales right now are backlist, like from yep. the, you know, normal, like traditional sales channels. So like book, brick and mortar bookstores, Amazon, like that kind of stuff. And if you are a brand new author that has no backlist, that means that like already authors who have a book out have a 75% sales advantage over you. So publishers who are like, in the past have been more willing to take risks on new artists who maybe don't have all those like little bits and pieces in place already are looking at other authors who like they might not be the best authors out there but they have a sales record and they have something that they can build on and that's becoming like more and more and more appealing so it makes it really really difficult if you've never traditionally published a book because people can come with like even a modest sales record and right now chances are good statistically that that's going to grow over time. Whereas in the past, people used to be way more invested in front list books, like new release books. And so if you came with something like new and special and amazing, like that actually gave you a huge advantage over even people who were selling older titles. So that shift and that happened, like we publishing knew that was coming, but it got increased exponentially by the pandemic when people like discoverability of books changed because people weren't seeing things on shelves so new releases were like flying under the radar and then also by tiktok where people you know like book reviewers who are going viral they're not necessarily reading a brand new book they're probably reading something that they got from the library or from barnes and noble or whatever that they bought four years ago and has been sitting on their shelf for a while. And so those books are getting like a whole new life, which is exciting if you have a backlist and extra challenging if you do not. <laughs> did you ever get this, Emmy? You know, uh, hi, I'm writing a submit. I need an agent. I'm the next JK Rowling, you know, uh, <laughs> right? Like once a week. <laughs> 100%. So in addition to now, I know that's more of a queer letter thing, but like, obviously, like, why do you think people do that kind of, on one level, they're doing something correct, which is providing comps, right? Yes, totally. Always uh, provide a comp. But like, obviously, it's kind of in a diff, the ba a wrong headed way. Um, <laughs> yeah. where, where do you see stuff like that in a manuscript where it's like, they're just doing, it's like, maybe they're doing something right, but they're kind of doing it the wrong way in a manner of speaking, or they're just mm -hmm. kind of not quite hitting the all cylinders like what are some of the other things that you're just kind of you keep seeing where you're like i wish i could this was a different way yeah structurally is a huge question because one of the things that's really really tough is that a lot of authors will have read heavily books that were published like 10 15 years ago which is awesome like i have no qualms with older books and absolutely i think it's great that people are widely read you know what i mean especially if you're writing in a particular like if you're targeting a particular audience like domestic thriller like yes read every domestic thriller that you can get your hands on but people don't necessarily realize how quickly book tastes shift and so if you're not reading the newer titles that are coming out which were acquired three four years ago now you're really not going to know kind of where publishing is headed in terms of reader expectations and publisher expectations so that happens all the time and the way that it often manifests right now i'm finding is that people don't realize so when you i laughed when you were talking about stephen king and how his like really immersive style of storytelling became kind of a staple of his that's really become a staple of publishing over the last few years especially where like i think it has a lot to do with streaming becoming like like television streaming becoming so much more popular because people have access to such a huge amount of media that books are really expected to i mean they're just another form of media right so in some senses they're really expected to compete with video games and movies and all of that kind of stuff obviously not all books are like that like you know there's a whole thing of literary publishing where slow quiet books like really find their place in the world and that's all I fine call books anti-social media exactly <laughs> yes <laughs> but there are definitely certain genres especially things like if you're writing a book that's meant to be a beach read or meant to be commercial or meant to be like adventure or thriller those kinds of books like you really need to compete with the pacing that you're seeing in other places and so what i see so often is people will send in like their first we usually ask for like the first 10 pages or something like that as a writing sample it's a short amount anyway but it's usually from like the top of your book and what i 
see so often is that people will start a book with like a huge amount of exposition. And that was incredibly popular. Like I would say like in the late nineties, like early aughts, but these days we don't really start with exposition. Like most books will start with like an inciting incident or like a propulsive plot point or a really like immersive action filled scene because it it is this thing about distraction right we're picturing people consuming books in all kinds of ways so audio like adaptations e-reading all of these things where people are reading in like little snippets in the middle of like an otherwise really busy day and they're being pulled in all kinds of different directions right and so what you really need is for people to pick up that book and not want to put it down and that's like that writing sample at the beginning it needs to not be exposition like it needs to not be like someone starting their day or like us getting like a long backstory like usually it needs to be these days something that's really going to hook people like right from the beginning and you get a little more leeway as your book you know as people get invested in the book probably 10 chapters in they're not going to like close the book and walk away because you're telling me what your character had for lunch but that's not true of the first page they absolutely will (laughs) so I would say that that kind of flip of structural expectations has really changed in a short period of time. And that's something I see a lot of as well. It's not necessarily something that I'll pass on a book for as long as the content is there, but I'm definitely going to like tell people that their book is like a bit of a puzzle and we're going to like have to break it up and like put it back together again. (laughs) What's the line? I mean, I was kind of abstract, but is Mm -hmm. what's the kind of line where you're, it kind of divides a book that you'll you'll work to improve versus mm-hmm. one you won't. That's such a good question. For me, this is going to be different for every agent. I should qualify this answer because I really like doing editorial work and our agency is quite small and hands-on. So I get a lot of leeway in terms of what I'm able to take on. Um, that's not true of all agents. And also some agents just don't like doing that editorial work. Like they'd rather just sign things that are like sales ready. Um typically the books that like I'm willing to put elbow grease in on are ones where I think that the story is something that like people really need to hear and that I haven't seen before um so often it's like a values judgment for me um I won't usually work really hard on a book that I'm like for example if it's just like a really cute rom-com I'm like there are eight billion really cute (laughs) rom-coms I'm not gonna spend like six months like you know, like crowbarring this into shape with somebody, unless I feel like the author hasn't had access to the information they need to, to be able to get it to the place where it should be. Like if they just don't know that there are genre conventions that they're missing, and I think they're capable of doing that work, then sometimes I might consider it. But if somebody sends me something that's like really fascinating and interesting, or about like maybe some social issue or something like that, that I feel like I haven't seen in books before, or they're writing from a place that I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. Like your experience is not something I've seen explored. Like those are the kinds of books that I'm like, okay, this might not be perfect, but like, I think we're getting there. Or alternately, if the writing blows me out of the water, like really, really good writing, but like people just don't, like maybe the author doesn't have a grasp on like the industry expectations or like, there just needs to be that like okay we're gonna like break this down scene by scene and just like put them in different places like that kind of work if the writing is like really really amazing I'm a sucker for that (laughs) no this is really uh useful and helpful I think uh what is before I let you go uh I don't want to take too much of your time can we maybe hit just one or two other little things where it's like just unique to you I, I what I like to call your bugbears what's your bugbear people yeah, don't totally. like my daughter's always making fun of me for saying bugbear <laughs> i love but bug i still bear. like that but yeah what's yeah. what's your sort of bugbear where it's like maybe it's just you uh yes, but totally. it's you know a thing that drives you nuts in these queries or in these submissions yeah so i have a few of them <laughs> one of them is so grammar is always important i think people underestimate the value of good grammar in their book just generally overall because it really is for agents and editors a measure of how much work you're going to have to do on the book in a lot of ways i'm always doing the mental math when i'm reading a sample of like okay how much would i have to copy edit this for it to be acceptable to go to an editor 
and do I think that author could do it on their own or would I be doing that like because it's a ton of work to do if especially like for example that comes up a lot if you're writing in a language that isn't your first language sometimes like sometimes it's super worth it but sometimes you just have to get somebody else to copy edit it you know what I mean so anyway that's like my spiel on grammar but my personal pet peeve is when people start sentences with coordinating conjunctions I hate it with like a passion it's become super trendy because if done tactfully and like with restraint it can be kind of voicey and I think that in some genres like the YA age category rom-coms specifically it's used more than not to make things feel conversational and casual and that kind of thing but I think that authors see that in published books and they think like, oh, I can just write the way that I hear things in my head and not the way that grammar actually works. And it makes it extremely awkward for someone else to read. So I constantly, even with my clients, am going through manuscripts erasing like, but, then, and from the beginning of sentences. And you'd be shocked how often you can just get rid of it and the sentence still makes perfect sense and it still conveys what you want it to convey, but it doesn't feel like every sentence you're writing is a sentence fragment, which drives me up the wall. I literally tell people that I'm allergic to sentence fragments and after a while if they do it a lot in their manuscripts in like a teasing way I'll just send my clients like a sneezing emoji rather than writing anything like that's what they'll get as the comment is like a sneezing emoji because I'm like I'm so tired of this and they know that it drives me nuts but like it's just one of those things that people do stylistically these days um The other thing is first pages. I don't think people ever pay enough attention to their first page. I think people think that like if they've edited it 20 times, it must be good. But I would challenge people to like, if you think it's done, like give it a couple days and do it again. (laughs) I I really recommend to people, there's an agent in the US called Noah Lukeman. And Mm -hmm. Noah Lukeman has written a series of books uh, on like editing and uh, writing. Uh, And he has this great book called The First Five Pages. And that's what it is. It's just like how to rewrite your first five pages. Like the idea, of course, being that you'd carry that out through the rest of it. But he goes into detail about like, look, from the point of view of an agent, like here's how important those first five pages are. And here's the common mistakes writers make and so on. And of course, you're mentioning some of them. Yeah. Well, and people, I think, think that like it's overblown how good your first couple of pages have to be because it's so tedious but the reality is like not only are you querying me with those first couple of pages but like that's what I'm going to send to editors too right like and then they're going to be thinking about like okay well my marketing people are going to be seeing this as the opening to your book the marketing people are then thinking about like okay the super busy like single mom who's standing in chapters like opening it up and reading the first couple of pages to see if this is the book they're going to pick like it never goes away so I I'm so picky about the first page. I always want to see at least the main character, a hint at what the central conflict of the book is going to be. Like, I want to know that right from the first page. And I also want to know a little bit about like what kinds of challenges or like barriers the character is going to face and also what kinds of advantages they have or like facilitators are on their side. And it's so much to cram into a page, but you have to like, I want it. (laughs) I have to have it. So I feel like I have sent entire manuscripts back to people and been like the first page isn't good enough. Do it again. (laughs) In screenwriting, it's very common for people if they get a new script uh, Mm -hmm. to look at the first page and look at the last page and then decide if you're going to read the rest. Yeah. My from academic work, that's like my I know that some agents or readers like consider this to be total sacrilege, but I always read when I have a full manuscript, I read the first chapter and the last chapter, and then I open to like what I think is roughly the middle and I read like a middle section. And from there, I've basically decided whether or not I'm going to read the whole book or not. Um, Now, people hate when I say that uh, what you just said. People are going to react against this. So really quickly, like this is the logic of it. So one, the logic is. Is it hooking and drawing interest at the start? Do you, you want yep. to keep reading? Uh, and as you say, that matters for you, that matters for the person you're selling it to, that matters for the mm-hmm. person in line at the bookstore, et cetera. But also yeah. uh, flipping to the end, the big question is like, did something change? Yes, exactly. Um, like, did you it's not just about like, is there? it a good ending? <laughs> it's like, well, did it, the story have significance? Like, was there a, an actual change that this character went through or the world went through or whatever? Uh, yeah. Because stories, at least traditionally stories, unless you're doing an ex- talking about an experimental story mm-hmm. yes, where the course. thesis is that <laughs> nothing changes and the universe yes. is a nightmare, <laughs> which Time you know, don't tend to sell well. Not like a good <laughs> strategy. Yeah. yeah. But like for the most part, like books on a fundamental level are about. Mm-hmm 
how the belief that the world can change. Exactly. Um, and so stories that don't have that movement, uh, it, there's almost nothing you can do to fix them or make them marketable at least. Exactly. Yeah. I want to get a sense of like the arc of the story. So that's like, I, I'm really impatient as a reader and I want to know like right from the start what it is I'm going to get from the book. So that's why I always read the opening chapter, obviously. And then the last chapter, I want that like freeze frame at the end where like the hero is standing there like bloodied and beaten and, you know, like I want to know like where are we going with this or like what did what happened you know and then I do obviously the journey matters so I definitely read some of the middle as well to like get a sense of like how that action is progressing but if those three things aren't in place on like a basic level then like chances are good that reading the rest of the book and taking like a week to do it is not going to be a good investment of my time now before I kind of let you go and we end off here let me just get one last what is the one thing that if you see it one more time your head's gonna explode <laughs> oh my gosh that's such a good question oh there are a few <laughs> i can think of this one query that we've gotten the same query like a million different times but honestly i think that the thing that is like you un unique question mark that people think is unique anyway is telling us like how much better than some older author they are like i'm the next like you mentioned jk rowling but we also get like tolkien stephen king dan brown whatever like i feel like that's a huge misconception like we're not actually looking for the next jillian flynn like we have jillian flynn you know like she's done her thing she's been writing for a long time i love her books lots of people love her books but like i don't want to read her again i want to read something new and different you know and so sometimes formulaic is great i read a lot of books that are formulaic and i love them and if that's what you're doing like oh this is for a lover of like this trope or like this type of book then that's different to me than trying to be like the archetype of someone else's writing you know like that doesn't make me want to read more of your writing it makes me want to go pick up gone girl again and read it for the first time you know or harry potter or whatever like whatever like magical mystery book you think you're going to give me like the second version of like I don't want a second version of that I like want your interesting new story you know so I feel like pitching yourself as you know like the combination of things can sometimes be helpful or like telling me themes or like having good comps is great but if that's the only selling point that you're going to give me for your book like it doesn't make me excited you know I want to know what's different and what's interesting about people's stories so yeah, that's that's something that drives me crazy. <laughs> well, thanks uh, again so much for talking to me, Emmy. And if you are out there listening and you have a terrible query and a manuscript <laughs> that you want to send to Emmy Nordstrom Higdon, uh, they are with Westwood Creative Arts. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I have my personal website is uh, emmy.ooo. Emmy, ooh. <laughs> nice. So people can find all my details there too. Wonderful. And uh, thanks again for talking to me and uh, keep agenting the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>